stay standing for a minute. You know, when we uh, think about holiness, usually we have this list of do's and don'ts, and we think biblically that's holiness, but really that's just a very small part of it. That holiness, biblically speaking, means three things. One, to embrace the person of Christ because he becomes your holiness. Secondly, to embrace the ways of Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. But thirdly, to embrace the destiny, the purpose and the calling God has for each one of our lives. When Moses ascended the hill of the Lord and God commissioned him and released him into his calling and destiny, the Lord said, you're standing on holy ground. And as we sing about holiness, God is a holy God, but also understand the holiness of his is so thorough that the plans he has for your life and my life are holy unto him. So turn to the person next to you before you sit down and say, you've got a holy calling upon you. You've got a holy calling upon you. <laughs> Thank you. Well, how is everybody? Are you alive on a Sunday morning? If you're dead, raise a hand and we'll pray for you first during the ministry time. I'm just curious. Uh, uh, we won't have testimonies right now, maybe tonight, but how many of you were here last night and received prayer for maybe knees, hips, backs, stomach conditions, that already you're seeing something significantly different in your health? How many people here? Anybody? Raise a hand. Come on. Oh, okay. Cece, are you different? Oh, maybe we'll have a testimony. Come on up here. Come on up here. Do we have a mic for her? We gave a word of knowledge last night about TMJ. And I think, do we have a mic for her to use? Oh. Thank you. Uh, so we gave a word of knowledge about TMJ and you responded to that. So what is TMJ? How, what's it been like? So um, you sort of gave a word of knowledge about sort of people with jaw problems um, yesterday. And um, funnily enough, before I, before you gave that sort of word of knowledge, I was sitting in the congregation and um, I've just had problems with my jaw for about five or six years where I haven't sort of been able to open my mouth fully and sort of I have like a locking um, thing sometimes when I'm chewing like really chewy foods and things like that. It was as a result of like a... Um, having some teeth removed to get braces in and I haven't like had full functionality of my jaw in about like five or six years basically because of that and sometimes when I'm singing it can cause problems or like when I'm eating and things like that and you were sort of um, mentioning specific symptoms and all of them were sort of associated with things that I've been experiencing um, and as I was sort of sitting in the congregation I was just sort of like crying out to God saying sort of I've been suffering from this thing for about five or six years and sort of I just thought it was something that I had to live with and um, I was sort of asking God if he could sort of show me that he's still listening to me and sort of he still cares about me even though I know that he does um, and yeah when when you called me up and you prayed for me um, I sort of felt like this I, I don't quite know how to describe it but there was a like strange sensation sensation in my jaw as you began to pray for me like almost like my jaw began to vibrate in a sense, like something was just going on. And when I closed my eyes, I felt like I saw sort of as though there was something that had been like holding me captive that was sort of falling falling off as I as you prayed for me. Um, and so that was like quite a strange experience. And yeah, needless to say, when I got home, I told Akka that my jaw had felt the best it's felt in about five or six years and the whole clicking and locking thing was all of a sudden, I wasn't experiencing that anymore. Wow. So, yeah, that's So how was it? Oh. 
How was it singing this morning? Um, it was it was fine singing. It was great singing, and even sort of eating yesterday. We had a nice pizza after, and <laughs> <laughs> I was able to sort of eat with um, like more ease than I felt in a very very long time. Right. And sort of all that feeling was just sort of like coming back to me. Um, so yeah. Great. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is there anybody else here that you have TMJ, your jaw gets tight, maybe clicking or tight when you talk or you eat? Anybody else have that problem? Okay. Okay, just stand up if you have that problem. And someone put hands on her, but don't choke her. But just, and would you go ahead and say in your own words, Lord, you know, Jesus said, freely, freely receive, freely, freely. Because just pray a prayer, Lord would give her what he gave you. Heavenly Father, I just pray that just as you have given me healing, that you would heal your daughter. Yes. God, I pray that your healing power would just fall upon her right now. And the same thing that I experienced yesterday, that she would experience right yes. now. Lord God, I pray that you would just magnify her faith and give her the strength to believe that you can do miracles and that you still do miracles and that just as you worked a miracle in my life yesterday that you will continue to work a miracle in her lord i pray that even right now she'll begin to feel a release in her jaw area lord yes. i pray that any lack of feeling or functionality or any locking or clicking will just begin to fall away right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray that just as I have given my testimony here, that we will see Volaji giving her testimony to your congregation and to your people. And may everybody in this room have their faith strengthened and increased as a result of these miracles. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. Okay, Aka, you're on notice. She's going to start preaching a lot more. <laughs> Just start preaching a lot more to you. <laughs> All right. This morning, I uh, gave, in the first service, I gave kind of a part one in a general sense, a word that I believe the Lord is, uh, has for you all this season, the history of this church. Pioneering, doing some things you haven't done before and maybe doing some things how you used to do it, doing that differently. I believe, in effect, you're about to cross over a Jordan into some promises God has had for you quite a while as a church. But I want to, uh, four people are excited, that's great. So I want to give a more specific, a part two to that message about pioneering. And I define pioneering as breaking into new territory. It could be in research and development, could be in science, could be in all sorts of things to pave a way for other people to follow. But first, I want to read to you out of Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes the times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things he knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with them. He is the God of the times and seasons. I've had a, a phrase that I've used uh, for, I don't know, 40, 50 years now about life. And in life, the choice is to change or to be changed. Being human beings, we like to camp out at what we've already established, what we've already achieved, because we feel comfortable in that. But how many of you know in this season of economic uncertainty with, you know, the wars, rumors of wars going on, the possibility of what could happen, that this is not a time just for hunkering down. It's not a time for running to the cave, say, oh, just protect me. But I believe just as God spoke into the confusion, the chaos upon the earth in Genesis, so to speak, the Holy Spirit is speaking today to the church. And it's time to take new ground for the kingdom of God. How many of you know there's a huge segment of society today, doesn't matter what their ethnic background is, doesn't matter what their social strata is, doesn't matter what their economics are, that people today are living with a heavy fear factor. And guess what? You and I are called to represent the Prince of Peace. That is a peace that passes all of that. And we're called to be people of change. The problem is when we try to camp out 
at yesterday's victories, if we allow it to, it will become today's plateau. It will become tomorrow's gutter. Another life first for me is 1 Corinthians 2.9, in which Paul said, No eye has seen, nor ear heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. God has far more for you and I than we have any idea. This is why the Bible says, for example, in the Psalms, we're to go from strength to strength. Or as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, from glory to glory, not camping out at yesterday's breakthroughs. Pioneering, as I said, is breaking into uncharted territory and making it habitable or safe to other people to follow. It could be in the business world doing something that hasn't been done. It could be in science and research. It could be in ministry for the kingdom of God. It could be a lot of areas. So I'm going to talk about a few examples this morning. Abraham, who pioneered, left everything he had. He and, he and Sarah went to a land they barely knew anything about. Moses taking the people from uh, Egypt to the promised land on that journey. Jesus bringing in the kingdom of God, leaving heaven for our sakes, coming to earth as a man. Hudson Taylor, an Englishman, 1854, left everything here behind, went to a place that really very few people in the West knew anything about, went to China and pioneered this incredible work of the kingdom. And still today, there's people in China, Christians, that can trace their spiritual heritage straight back to what that man pioneered, going to a completely alien culture, you know? And uh, China was just in absolute turmoil in those days. We can think of, you know, I, I know you all here, you absolutely love American baseball, right? But one of our great heroes in American baseball is Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson, if you ever meet, seen the movie 42, it's worth watching. But at that time, in the 1940s, unfortunately in America, you know, we had so much racism. And so African Americans were not allowed to play in the major leagues, they had their own leagues. And Jackie Robinson was the first man to broke that barrier. It was a great challenge, and I'm going to talk a little bit about him. But I'm also going to mention Chuck Yeager, who was an American Air Force pilot during World War II. He shot down more Nazi airplanes than anybody else in the air battles, but he went on to break the sound barrier, and we'll talk about why that's important or how we can relate to that. And I believe if we look at things like John 15, 8, Jesus said, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to me my disciples. We realize there's a weight upon us not just to try to get to a certain level of success, whatever that's measured in, whether it's measured in finances, whether it's measured in position, popularity, prestige, or a ministry level, whatever it may be, but God has created us in his image to continue to grow, not camp out at yesterday's. I'm glad you're excited. Yes, sir. So I want to talk to you about four essential, maybe five, quickly, essential keys for pioneer breakthrough living. First of all is listening to the Holy Spirit. If God has more for you than your eyes have seen, your ears have heard, more you can understand, if God really has more for you than you can possibly understand, how in the world do you bridge that gap between what you understand and what you don't understand the will of God? Well, it's very simple. The prophet Joel prophesied about Christianity, the New Testament, New Covenant, and he said the young men and women will prophesy. The older ones dream dreams. The young men will see visions. I have a a friend, he's uh, from South Africa, grew up in Cape Town, and he was a business executive there for many years. And he was an elder in a church, and this is going back about 20 years ago, uh, back to the height when there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of Toronto, a church I'd been very involved in. And he was on a business trip, a conference in uh, New York City, and he uh, arranged a few days with his ticket, and he went up to Toronto to take some of the meetings. He'd heard about the outpouring. And the first couple of nights, you know, he went, listened to the worship, the, uh, you know, the worship music, took that in, and the preaching, teaching. He went forward, got prayer. Nothing seemed to happen. 
And the third night, he decided, ah, this just isn't happening for me. And so he was actually on the phone with the airline trying to fly back to New York City a day early. And while he was on the phone, the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, I haven't told you to leave yet. You get to the meeting. And the meeting had already started, and he was staying at this hotel about a half mile down, and he realized, you know, if, if he waited for a taxi or something, so he actually jogged, you know, a half mile down the road from his hotel, got to the meeting, and, you know, the end of worship's going on, and then one of us preached there, and we have the ministry time. In those days, we were getting, like, anywhere from 500 to 1,500 people every night, six nights a week. That went on for six years or so. And so he's thinking, well, the first night, nothing really happened. When they prayed for me, the second night, nothing really happened. He said, I know, tonight I'll get one of the leaders of the church, or Mark, or you know, John or not, or somebody. I'll get one of the leaders, the big guns, to pray for me. And he's kind of following some of us leaders around. And he said, this grandmother-type lady walks him, this real sweet, short, quiet, demure lady walks up to him and said, hi. I'm on the ministry team of the church. I also teach Sunday school. Can I pray for you? And he's thinking, oh, you know, I don't need some Sunday school teacher to pray for me. But, you know, he wasn't a rude man, so he said, yeah, sure, you can pray for me. Next thing he knows, it's two and a half hours later, and he's on the floor under the power of the Holy Spirit. And that lady sat with him the whole time praying for him. And as he's kind of coming out of the spirit, she had a word for him. The Lord is gonna send you and your wife to where the wild clover flowers grow. He didn't have a clue what that meant. <laughs> well, he ends up getting back to Cape Town and he did some research and he found there's, there's a real remote area called Clarence, about two hours north of Johannesburg. Very few people lived there. A few artists lived there. There were about uh, three or four townships around there, but a very poor area, but nothing happening. But he found out it's the one place in South Africa where the wild clover flowers grow. Wow. So he, he, he's praying, and the Lord is giving him this stuff he never imagined before, and he ended up selling his share of his business. He and his wife took all their money, moved up to Clarence, they bought a farm. He knew nothing about farming. And this farm had a barn, and this barn was right next to the river that separated uh, uh, the area of Rhodesia, you know? And uh, that small nation there within the nation of South Africa. And the Lord said, I want you to convert this barn into a sanctuary. Get it all cleaned up, make it nice inside, and buy 500 chairs. And he's thinking, Lord, we're out in the middle of nowhere here. I don't know anybody. Hardly anybody lives here. What am I going to do with 500 chairs? The Lord said, do it. So he spent a lot of the money, you know, he had left over from buying the farm, fixed up the barn, bought 500 chairs, and he's putting posters up in the little town of Clarence. You know, the Clarence only had, you know, like maybe 1,000 people, you know, and they already had a couple of churches there. And he puts up these 500 chairs, and then the Sunday comes, and he's gonna be thinking, man, if we get 10 people, you know, I'm gonna feel good. What began to happen across the river that separated the property of his farm from Rhodesia, a tribal people, 499 of them came across, waded across the river, it was rather shallow there, and filled up that barn. Wow. And he found out that there was actually one more person that was on the way but got stuck for some reason. They would have had all 500. They st he started this church there, and it was one of the first really racially mixed churches in the area. And then they moved the church after a few years into the city of Clarence. And Clarence was surrounded by three townships, a lot of people in poverty. He started a school there. His church started a school to teach young kids. And they had such an incredible impact on the three tribes in that area, the three townships, that the ANC actually changed the name of that town, what they called it, and they changed it after the name of his church, Church on a Hill. That all came about because he listened 
to what the Lord had to say to him. God has more for you than your eyes have seen, your ears have heard more than you can possibly imagine. And this is why Jesus said he will not leave us as orphans, but he would send the Holy Comfort of the Holy Spirit. And as Paul said, the Holy Spirit will lead you and guide you. So all of our lives, paying attention. I'm not saying we get a word every minute, a word every day, even a word every week. But season by season, especially when the changes come, God says in Amos, he will do nothing without first revealing it to his people. Secondly, and you're going to love this second key, learning to honor God's delegated authority. I told you you would like it. <laughs> we live increasingly in an anti-authority age. In fact, we've got what you know could be called the spirit of lawlessness. But I am convinced that so many Christians have not really come into the potential of what God has for them because they insist on doing their thing when they want to do it, how they want to do it. There's a story in 2 Samuel chapter 18. And what this story has to do with is Absalom, David's son, most of you know this, have, has brought a coup against David, tried to steal the kingship away from David. And when Absalom first raised up this army to steal the kingship from David, the few troops that were loyal to David and Joab, they got David, got him out of the city, took him to a mountain stronghold, a place of safety. And then Joab and the troops that were still loyal, they went down to a battle plain and they confronted the army of Ahab that was trying to pull this coup. And by the grace of God, David's army and Joab, they won the day. But, Joe, but David did not know this. He was miles away up in a safe mountain stronghold. And so it says that, that uh, Joab, he said to a young man, he, who was a runner in those days, you know, obviously no internet and how they brought news. They had official runners. And those runners could run dozens and dozens and dozens of miles nonstop. And he said to him, uh, Go, bring the news to the king. And so that young man started running. But there was another young man there, and he said, let me run also to bring the king to the news. You can read this in 2 Samuel chapter 18, around verse 22. And it's interesting what Joab said to him. He said, you will run, but not today. We all need people that from time to time can sit on us. We all need people that from time to time, they will look us in the eye, look us in the heart, and say, I believe in you, I believe in this gifting, I think I see this in you, but you're not yet ready for it. Think about it, how many great athletes or movie stars or pop stars that we know about that as very young men and women, all of a sudden they're making millions and millions of dollars, have all the fame, all the accolades, all the popularity, only to crash and burn from drugs, alcohol, depression, and just problem after problem. You know, one of the great tests of a person's character is failure, but the other great test of a character is success. And there are times even though God may have put talents and abilities and even vision within you, that the Lord says, you will run, but not today. We think about Joseph, you know, that God had raised up. He was a young man, had a vision. He didn't really understand it yet, but to be this incredibly powerful leader. In fact, he ended up, as most of you know, the second most powerful person in the world at that day, right under uh, the king, the Pharaoh of Egypt. But yet, he spent years in prison. He spent years unjustly as a slave. His brothers sold him into slavery. His brothers even wanted, spoke about killing him. And years and years and years later, when Joseph is in this incredible place of power, his brothers come to him because there's a famine in the land. They come to Egypt, get some food, and they didn't recognize Joseph because so much time had changed. And as well, he's this very prestigious, important leader. They didn't recognize him, but he recognized them. 
And in those days, someone at Joseph's position, what they would commonly do to their enemies when they came into power is just have them killed. That was it, no questions asked. You know, that's what a king would do in those days. But when he revealed himself that I'm Joseph, your brother, they had this fear, he would have them killed. But he looked at them and said, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. But you know, I believe it took those years of hardship in Joseph's life for him to learn to be Christ-like. Even as Jesus hung on the cross, looked at humanity and said, Father, forgive them, they know what they do. And it's not that God doesn't have great plans for your life, but sometimes we can't step into it. And so Joab said, you will run, but not today. And the other runner, the official runner, took off. And then the other guy, he, he said, whatever happens, I'm going to run. And Joab said to him, why would you run? You will have no reward. He said, well, I'm going to run anyway. He said, well, go ahead and run. Sometimes, maybe it's a parent, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a coach, maybe it's a supervisor. They're trying to slow you down a little bit. And you think, oh, they're just insecure. They're just this. They're just that. They're just jealous. Well, there could be that factor, but sometimes God is in it because he's preparing you to be highly effective in a future moment of success. Job said, why would you run? You'll have no reward. Well, that second runner, he was, so, he was actually so gifted, even though the first runner had a head start, he outpaced him and he got to David first. And he said, David, your highness, the kingdom's restored to you. But you see, he only had half the news. David was glad the kingship had been restored to him, but he also he still loved Absalom, his son. How did it go with Absalom? I don't know. And David said, stand aside over here. And then the official runner came, and he had the full news. And sometimes when we run prematurely, we don't have everything God would intend for us for that position. We look at Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the only begotten Son of the Father. One day he went walking out to where John was baptizing people. Jesus is God Almighty and a man. John is only a man, a created being. But Jesus submitted to his baptism. And John actually had a problem with that. John was pre preaching repentance of sin, and Jesus comes walking out. John knew he had no sin to repent of, and he said, you come to me for baptism, I need to be baptized by you, meaning of the Holy Spirit. It's interesting what Jesus said. Nevertheless, let it be done so that all righteousness may be fulfilled. What did he mean, all righteousness fulfilled, if he had no sin to repent of? Jesus understood, even though he was the King of kings and Lord of lords, and John was only a man, that the father, at, or John at that moment was still the father's chief spokesman for the kingdom. And as he was submitting to John and was baptized, he was actually submitting to the father. And I tell you, I see so many gifted men and women in churches all around the world that have just spun their, their going around in circles for years because sometimes they refuse to honor a pastor's authority. Are pastors always right? Well, except for Albert. No, they're not always right. <laughs> pastors are human beings. You know, we all have problems. I like what some pastors say. Church would be great if it weren't for all the people who go there. <laughs> but, you know, in life, it could be a pastor. It could be your boss. It could be a supervisor, whatever it may be. It could be a coach. You maybe have issues with them, and maybe they're not doing everything righteously. But yet... God honors authority. I am a passionate uh, motorcyclist, and I, I just love being in the mountains, going fast in the uh, curves on my sport bike. And uh, I had a revelation, you know, many years ago that when you're approaching a tight curve and the sign says 15 mile an hour curve ahead or 20 mile, that sign was put there for cars, not for motorcycles. <laughs> Here's my problem. I've had at least four police officers who have not had that revelation. 
And when they've pulled me over and they walk up to me and they ask that magic question that they ask all over the world, do you know why I've pulled you over? I don't argue, I don't give them lip service, I don't try to defend myself. I say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I absolutely know why you pulled me over. And I've got my registration, my license, my insurance, my hand. Now, this absolutely drives my wife crazy. All four times I've been let off with warnings. <laughs> no ticket. And it's a little bit funny because uh, after the last time I was pulled over and let off with the warning, I was uh, about a week or two later, I was sitting in L.A. International Airport waiting to catch a flight. And someone left a newspaper, the L.A. Times, next to me. So I picked up, started reading it. There was an article by a woman police officer, and this what, what the title was, What to Do When You're Pulled Over for Speeding. I thought, wow, this is going to be like revelation. I need to read this. And you know what she said? She said, I and most of my colleagues, when we pull people over, we're looking for reasons to have mercy, to not give them a ticket. But she said, if they become argumentative, if they give us lip service, become defensive, we then look for every single ticket we can possibly give them. <laughs> it's a matter of honoring authority. Yes. And we understand in the world today, I understand this very much in my country, that not every police officer is a righteous police officer. Not every teacher is a perfect teacher. Not every coach is a great coach. We understand this, but yet we've been majoring in being a spirit of lawlessness in society. And, and I've even seen many Christians, it's kept them back, their destiny. I'm glad you're excited. Yes. Third, the third key is believing God despite the outward situation. Proverbs 3, 5, lean not to understand, but trust the Lord with all your heart. So Chuck Yeager, he was the greatest of all the fighter pilots in World War II. And they say his secret was his eye vision. That most of us, if we have good vision, it's called 20-20. He had, I think it's called 15-20. He could see at 20 feet what most people see at 15. They say his eyesight was so sharp that when they were soaring above the clouds, he could see sunlight glinting off an enemy aircraft 50 miles on the horizon. And so he was always on top of enemy aircraft. He was always aware of what was about to take place. But keep that in mind. God calls us to have eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit's saying. One hallelujah. One person's excited. So I'm going to focus right over here on this person. <laughs> the rest of you kind of on your own there. So... After World War II in the United States, the, the new United States Air Force, they got the best of their pilots together out in the Mojave Desert, Northern California, to they, they were a program they started with experimental airplanes to build them as fast as they could. The goal was to break the sound barrier. They had never done it before. We don't think much of it. We get on planes all the time. Every day around the world, there's planes that are breaking the sound barrier. Typically, the sound barrier depends on humidity, atmosphere, but it's typically around 767 miles per hour. They did not have the technology yet to build a plane that could fly safely that fast. And there's a parallel there that sometimes when God is calling you to do something you've never done before, you feel like you don't have the aptitude, you don't have the skill set. But sometimes... It's when you step out of the boat of your comfort zone and you step into the waters of the will of God, that's when you learn by the grace of God to walk on water. Sometimes you grow as you go. Mark, that was a brilliant point. Do not be discouraged by the lack of response on that. <laughs> so they did not have the technology yet, but they kept doing more and more research. And they actually had one or two planes that they could not withstand the resistance as they're going faster and faster. The planes, you know, rivets popping out. The planes fell apart. Pilots died. They were basing everything on a theory 
called Einstein's theory of relativity. And Einstein believed that there would be greater and greater resistance until you break the sound barrier. And he said, then this, all the resistance will be gone. It's a little bit like that when you're stepping out into a new field, a new direction, a new challenge. There is more and more questions. Quite often the resistance is there. But once you break through, everything changes. And so one day Chuck Yeager was up in the latest and greatest plane, but the resistance was just, you know, <coughs> it felt like the plane was going to fall apart. And he said the plane was shaking so much, he had to have both hands on the rudder. The rudder itself was shaking like crazy. And, you know, he was telling them from the, the comm or whatever, you know, what was going on. They're saying, slow down, call it off. You know, they didn't want to lose him. But he believed in Einstein's th uh, theory of relativity. As you believe the promises of God for you, it's life. It's life. And so he kept going, and he broke through. And he radioed down, and he said, Einstein is right. I feel like I'm walking on clouds. And that's what it's like when we break in something new. But oftentimes, because God wants you to lean into his ability, he'll call you to do things that you feel completely overwhelmed to do. And that has to do with the fourth key, is learning that God's grace is more than sufficient. The Apostle Paul, he went through so, many persecu so much persecution. He was, he was stoned a, a couple of times. His whole body was a wreck towards the end of his ministry. And he prayed three times, and I believe he was praying about the persecution that God would lift that, change that in his life. But he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, that God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in your weakness. And then he said something really strange. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so the power of Christ may dwell in me. That doesn't make sense to our way of thinking. We think if we're gonna boast, we're gonna boast about our abilities or accomplishments. But Paul said, no, I'm gonna boast about my weaknesses because my weaknesses force me to lean into God. El Shaddai, God Almighty, the God who will do for you what you cannot do for yourself as you walk with him. I remember in the... Uh, early 80s, my wife and I were married in 82, and we were really learning a lot about praying for the sick and deliverance and prophecy in those days. And we were seeing a number of healings, but we weren't seeing creative miracles, like a withered limb, completely blind eye, or part of the stomach that had been destroyed by cancer. We weren't seeing miracles, healings on that level. And we were praying and praying and praying, you know, Lord, how do we move to the next level? And one day a woman came to me and she said, my mother's in the hospital. Her colon has been destroyed by cancer. They're gonna remove it and uh, you know, she'll have the plastic bag for the rest of her life, have to have that replaced every few years. Do you think you could come to the hospital this afternoon before they prep her for the operation and uh, pray that God would do a miracle? And I felt like the Lord said, yes. So I said, yeah, and I arranged two friends about two hours later to meet me at the hospital with the daughter. And I went home and I passionately prayed for about an hour and a half, oh God, we haven't seen this level of healing, this sort of miracle yet. How are we supposed to pray? Should we shout at the cancer, rebuke it in the name of Jesus? You know, you know should we just quietly soak the person? Do we just read scripture? What do we do? You know, the Lord is so kind and encouraging after an hour and a half of prayer, he didn't say anything at all. He just said, go. So we get there in the hospital room, my two friends and the daughter meet the lady in the bed, you know, and I'm and, uh, thinking, oh, gosh, what do we do? How do we pray for this lady? And all of a sudden, I remembered hearing a teaching that said, first, when you pray for people in hospitals, rebuke the spirits of sickness and death. That's kind of like the resident spirit of hospitals. It's, it's not like people go there to have a party or vacation, right? So... Uh, I did that. I said, in the name of Jesus, we take authority over every spirit of sickness and death in this hospital room. And then I said, without uh, really thinking about it, I said, Holy Spirit, would you please come and fill this room with your glory and grace? 
This is something at that time, even though we had good worship in our church, we had never experienced. The heaviness, the kabod, the heaviness of God's presence filled that hospital room. And I've told this story many times, and people usually don't believe this, but actually the room became noticeably brighter than the fluorescent lights. It was incredible. The holiness of God was so strong, my two friends and I got down our knees in the hospital room and began to sing uh, worship songs. That poor woman, she was already sick, and now she's hearing some bad singing, and <laughs> all she wanted was some prayers. But after about half hour or so, since the heaviness of the Lord lift, and we stood up, and I said to the woman, I said, God has been here. We know that Jesus is with us everywhere we go, wherever two or more gathered in his name, he's, he's there in a special way. But his manifest glory was there that afternoon. And I said, whatever God's going to done, he's done. His presence has been here. And the daughter called me up early the next morning. They never removed her colon. To their shock, they found it was in perfect condition. And so we learn, you know, and, and that's one of the most important lessons I've ever had in ministry, that when it comes to walking with God, it's not always what we know, but who we know that makes the difference. So very quickly, those four things, listening to God, honoring authority, believing God despite the outward situation, and learning that God's grace is sufficient, those are four keys to being a breakthrough person. And very quickly, two traps that can rob you of pioneer breakthrough living. One is allowing yesterday's good to become the enemy of the future great. Camping out on yesterday's success. Matthew 17, most of you know the story, the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, not all the disciples, just the three of them up the mountain, and they get to the top, and all of a sudden, Jesus, he's radiating some of his glory. And Moses and Elijah, the two great heroes of the Hebrew people, are appear as well. They're talking with Jesus. And uh, Peter pipes up, and he says, Lord, it's good that we're here. Kind of an understatement of the millennium. And he said, let us build three tabernacles, three monuments, one for you, one for Moses and Elijah. And a cloud came down. Quite often, God used a cloud to personify his, uh, his glory. Cloud came down and the Father spoke. And he said to Peter, James, and John, he said, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. In a sense, he was rebuking Peter. He was saying, Peter, I don't want you to make a monument even to the breakthrough of five minutes ago. Stay current with the current. Keep listening to my son. You know, and I've ministered in so many churches, so many different types of churches. Every once in a while, I end up with a church that maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, they had a big revival, grew tremendously, saw a lot of people saved, a lot of miracles, but they stopped seeking the Lord at a certain point in time. And you walk into those churches, and sometimes it just feels like a religious museum, you know? There's still an anointing from the past, but they've stopped being current with the current, you know? And we're called to go from strength to strength, glory to glory. The last thing I want to mention that can rob you of being a pioneer breakthrough person is something all of us do, unfortunately, is comparing yourself to others. It's so easy to look at somebody else and say, wow, if only I had his personality, if only I was born with her opportunities, if only I had their looks, if only I had their intellect, you know? You're always gonna find someone in a situation you wanna be in that just seems to be a little bit sharper, a little bit quicker, a little bit this, a little bit that. But you know what? God did not create you to be like anybody else. There's no two snowflakes in the world that are exactly alike, and I'm not talking about millennials. <laughs> There's no two eyes in the universe that are exactly alike. There's no two fingerprints that are exactly alike. God created you to be a unique reflection of him. And people, even Christians that specialize 
uh, that specialize in personalities, they say the odds of somebody else in the world having your exact personality are like seven billion to one. Your exact aptitudes, your abilities, the passions within you, as well as things like being an introvert or an extrovert, this or that, God created you. He, as David said, even in your mother's womb, the hand of God was upon you, fearfully and wonderfully, meaning carefully, did he create you. And the good news is, if you get too unique, we have counseling to help you out. <laughs> but, you know, it's so easy to look at somebody else and say, and you know, when you do that, when you fall into that trap, you're actually shortchanging God himself, his artistry in creating you. I'll close with this scripture that Matthew 25 Verses 14 through 29, Jesus gave the parable of the stewards and the talents. Many of you know this. To one, the master who was going on this long journey gave five talents, which was a measure of money to invest, to another two and to another one. And then he went on a long journey, came back from the journey. He wanted to know what they'd done with those talents. It's really a picture of Jesus going back to the Father when he returns for us, us giving an account of the opportunities and abilities he's given us. And so he first, the master came back, said to the one he'd given five talents to, what have you done with these five talents? And he said, well, I've doubled the master, I've gained five more. And he said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things, here's more besides. And, the, and then he also said something key, enter in to the joy of your master. Because see, God created us to be fruitful. God created us to be fruitful. God did not create you merely to survive and then sneak into heaven. God created you to be fruitful. That's why I quoted John 15, 8, the beginning of the message. And then the master went to the one he'd given the two talents to. What have you done with what I've given you? He said, well, master, you gave me two. I've gained two more. I've doubled it. The master said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in a few things. Here's more besides. Now enter into the joy of your master. Now usually when this is preached on, they then go to the one that he'd given one talent to, and he just buried it to hide it out of fear of losing it, and the master called him wicked and lazy because he didn't employ it. I don't want to focus on that. What I want to focus on in closing is the fact that although the one who'd been given two was not given as much as the one who had been in five, when he was faithful with it, his reward was the same. If you are faithful with the gifts, the talents, the opportunity God gives you, your reward is going to be great. Let's say in your lifetime, you lead 75 people to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're standing in line at the judging of the saints, and you're feeling pretty good about that. And then you realize Billy Graham is standing right in front of you. <laughs> You've led your 75 to the Lord. He's led his 75 million to the Lord. All of a sudden, you're not feeling quite so hot, you know. But the truth is, God did not give you the same calling as Billy Graham. He did not give you the same opportunities, the same gifting, the same exact personality. We'll be judged according to what God has given us. And this is the heart of God, that you enter in to the joy of your master. So, breaking these barriers. Do you know through the 1910s, the 1920s, the 1930s, the 1940s, the best track coaches in the world worked with the best athletes in the world to break the four-minute mile? They actually got to the point where some coaches began to believe maybe it's physically impossible. Maybe the body cannot just break that resistance of air and atmosphere, whatever. But then, what was it? 1954, William Bannister, near Oxford, England, he did it. Three minutes, 59 so and so seconds. He broke the four-minute mile. And you say, well, that's amazing. No, here's what's amazing. His record only lasted 47 days. Within three months of him breaking it, three other people ran faster than he did. 
No one broke it for 50 years of hard work. One person breaks it, and then all of a sudden, and today you can even find high school athletes once in a while that can break the four minute wall. Why? Because someone pioneered it. Once you hear a testimony of a breakthrough, it gives you faith. That's why we need to have testimonies. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And you know, that's just, if you're not gonna pioneer for yourself, why not do it for other people? Why not do it for your family? Why not do it for your children? Why not do it for the body of Christ? You know, God's called us to more than our eyes have seen, more than our ears have heard, more than we could possibly understand. Are you still alive? Yes. Let's all stand. Oh, wow, I'd forgotten you were even up there. Thank you for, <laughs> you're, you're a faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. <laughs> Tonight, we're gonna to be doing a lot of praying for different sicknesses, but here's what I wanna do. I realize, uh, have I gone overboard? No. Not yet, okay, I will. No. <laughs> There's a, a number of you here, maybe you feel like you're stuck in life. Could be a dead-end job or maybe unemployment, maybe your career path or your ministry got really messed up by COVID, the lockdowns, and or maybe in life you've been really hurt and you kind of, so to speak, dropped out of the game of life. You've just kind of been in a survival mode. And you hear this, say, that sounds really good, but how do I get the fire going again? How do I get the drive, you know? I'm not talking about ambition like the world thinks of ambition, you know, to you know, to be somebody in the eyes of the world and make as much money. I'm talking about to realize the Father's purposes in your life. Uh, but if for whatever reason, maybe uh, COVID or maybe hurts in life have given you setbacks, or maybe you just feel like you're stuck in a situation, however, this message may be encouraging to you, but you feel like, wow, how do I get traction again? How do I get some momentum again? If that's you, I want to ask you to forget about everybody else here. And actually, I can pretty much guarantee you they're not thinking about you anyway. <laughs> but forget about everybody else here. And if this word gives you a bit of passion, yes, Lord, you have more for me than my eyes have seen, my ears have heard, more to commend. I want you to get out of your seat, whether you're up there or down here. I want you to come down to the front right now. your way in. Yeah, go ahead and push your way over. Just we can uh, fill it up the area here. Come on in. Every tongue and try. 
Look at all the men and women have come forward this. Uh, I love it. It tells me you're a church of faith. You're a church of faith. So here's what I want to do. We've got a lot of people up here. I want to ask everybody who did not come forward, would you stretch a hand of blessing to these men and women? And if we could have some of the pastors and uh, leaders here kind of flow in the mist here, put hands upon people. But stretch your hands to the men and women who came forward. And, and uh, if you came forward, if it's not too religious, just hold your hands open. This is a sign. I believe God is going to begin to release faith into your life. But also, I believe he's going to open up some doors for you over the next few months. I believe some fresh opportunities. God is going to orchestrate some things and give you opportunities. And he's going to give you the faith to step through into these doors, step through these doors and these opportunities where maybe you haven't had faith in a while. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask right now that you would fill each of these men and women with your Holy Spirit. Would you fill them right now with the gift of faith? And Father, I thank you that there are no second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. We are all your sons and daughters. We have all been created in your image. I bless the personalities you've given these men and women. I bless the talents and abilities. I bless the abilities they don't even know about right now. I bless the undeveloped talents and abilities within them. And thank you, Father, for each person standing here right now, that you have more for them than their eyes have seen, more for them than their ears have heard, more for them than they can possibly imagine. So would you <clears throat> fill them now, Holy Spirit? Fill them. You know, the Holy Spirit is touching these men and women. I really need some of the leaders to flow through the midst, or if you're a Christian and one of them is a friend of yours, Get near them. Put a hand of blessing on them right now. I just bless you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I bless you to be filled with the gift of faith for you to walk out of here this morning knowing that you know that you know God is not done with you yet. God is not done with you. He knows the plans he has for you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Come, Holy Spirit, would you begin to fill, fill these men and women? This uh, young man right here with, yeah, you, what's your name? What's your Okay, this is, uh, I, I, I feel like the Lord is, would have me say to you that if you were the only person that had showed up this morning, I would have preached this message for you. You do not know the destiny God has for you. It is gonna be incredible. And I wanna encourage you that, you know, the, the former things have come to, uh, that are in your past that don't allow the things of your past to determine what your future is. You've got a big future ahead of you. Maybe a couple of leaders can just get near him and just bless him right now. Bless him be filled with the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing here. Thank you. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless Harrow International Christian Center. Would you pour out strategies this year? Would there, would there be a breakthrough of Holy Spirit entrepreneurship, creative ideas for people in the church, for people in business, people in their careers, people in the workplace, and for the ministries and ministries of this church? Would you begin to give Holy Spirit inspired creativities, ideas, strategies, and I pray that you would open doors for them that no man can shut. Lord, would you allow and would you cause this to be a year of kingdom breakthrough? And Lord, we just agree in the name of Jesus that you have more for us than our eyes have seen, more than our ears have heard, more than we can possibly imagine because you are a good, good father and your plans for us are the best. In Jesus' name.